But Exodus 16, we were talking last time, we just sort of covered the notion of manna, which again is one of my favorite topics. Uh, I'll just go ahead and, and, and give it away. I mean, the word manna in Hebrew, it, it, it tells exactly what this stuff is. It means simply, literally it means the what's its name or the what is it. Uh, because that's just, that's, you know, in Hebrew, that they walked out of their tents and there was bread on the ground and they said, what's that? So that became the name. They said, Menach, what's that? And that became its name. And so we'll talk more about that as, we'll probably spend a couple of weeks. Because one of the problems that I have is I start to look at things too long. And when I look at things too long, I start to preach about them a lot. And so uh, that's what we're sort of in the middle of right here. But that's, I think, okay. I think we've got a few weekends that we can, that we can take with this. But I'll talk about this morning something, a, a takeaway from, from not just the manna, but <clears throat> from what sort of prompted God to bestow the manna. And it's been the same thing that, that we've mentioned many, many times. It says, verse 16, chapter 16, verse 1, <clears throat> they took their journey from Elam and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for we have brought us forth into this, for you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So I want to, we talked about this last time I preached, and I'm not going to talk about it anymore about the specifics that we mentioned before. But one of the things that started to get to me was that statement in verse 3, the children of Israel said unto them, would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full. I've just been captivated by that mentality about how desperately Israel wanted to get out of Egypt for hundreds of years. And when they're finally gone, at the slightest hint of any trouble, what do they want to do? Run back to bondage. Writer of Hebrews calls a dog, calls a dog going back to its vomit. Just the idea of just going backward is always in the front of our mind. It would seem when things go bad. But I started to think about why that is, what, what, what you call that, or, or, or how you would sum that up. And I realized that it's something, I think, that hits their, their thinking in, in times of turmoil or stress or, or whatever, that really, since the dawn of time, has, has, has turned basically single-handedly fearless witnesses into shrinking violets. It's something that transforms the tears of people captivated by the condition of souls in this world into yawns over what seems like endless pleas for action. What makes them want to go back to Egypt, I believe, is something that has remade congregations once alive with spiritual anticipation into a sterile pool of preoccupied robots, basically. It's something awful. It's something to be avoided like spiritual poison. What is it? Can't read that. It's failed faith in the excellency of following God. Failed faith in the excellency of following God. It is this. It is comfort. What causes Israel to want to go back to where they were? What causes Israel to think that going back and being slaves is better than being out in the wilderness. First of all, understand this, their food wasn't gone. It was just getting low. And they began to panic. Oh, would to God, we would have died there, right? As opposed to here. They think they're going to die either way. At least we would have died in, in Egypt with full bellies, like we said before, after a good, long life. And think about it. You, you think about what they're saying. Boy, we would have preferred to be in Egypt and dying there, despite of the fact that we said before that they were enslaved. They were enslaved to the whim of the Egyptians. They were forced to labor. 
I mean, it wasn't something, it wasn't an option they had. It wasn't something that they could choose to do. They wanted to go back to a place where their every day was dictated by taskmasters, where every day they didn't have a chance to engage in creativity. They didn't have a chance to serve other people. They went out and they worked at whatever it was that they were assigned to do, which again is like living under tyranny. Moses, right, Moses is leading them through the wilderness. What they want, what they prefer, is let's go back to where there's tyranny. And that tyranny caused us to serve them for whatever purpose they choose. And of course, there's something else that we really don't even hardly consider. The drought of worship that existed in Egypt. There wasn't a lot of Old Testaments. (laughs) There weren't any Old Testaments, right? There's no worship. There's no synagogue. The synagogue isn't isn't created for for hundreds of thousands of years in the exile. They weren't worshiping. There's no tabernacle. There's no temple. There's nothing. (coughs) They're just there. And they would prefer to go back to a place where they really could not worship God as opposed to moving forward, no matter how desperate the times might seem, they're still moving forward to a place where they will worship God. That's the whole point that God said for letting his people go, right? That they may serve me in the wilderness. We want to go back to where we couldn't serve you at all. Okay? That, that, that. So you, when you think about it, when you break it down, you have to wonder what it was that drew them so persistently to want to go back. Because they, they say this almost at every turn where they face a little bit of lack or a little bit of uncertainty whether it's Mara, whether it's the Red Sea, whether it's Meribah that we'll see in the next time that we get into their next stop on the journey, they want to go back. And I thought, it can't just be because of the food. I mean, that's what they bring up here. You brought us out here to starve in this wilderness, but I don't think it's, it's just the food. It's like it wasn't just the water at, 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 at oh, Mar- not Meribah, um, Mara. It's like it wasn't just thirsty, right? There's something else that keeps calling them back, a different kind of comfort, right? There's the, the, the kind of comfort that causes people, and, and, and there's examples of this, the kind of comfort that causes people to accept the ugliness of their broader context, the ugliness of their broader context of living as long as they can possess a certain kind of comfort. For example, we, us who are older, and now it's been the talk of the news, of course, since the Ukraine disaster, but the old Soviet Union. I mean, why didn't people rise up 50 years before they did? There's a broad, that broader existence was awful. The bread lines and the lack of, uh, of individuality and the, and the lack of achievement and success. Why didn't they rebel? Because they were comfortable in their apartments. They were comfortable making sure things were tidy and neat. That little bit of comfort that they were allowed to have kept them from addressing the broader context. You see it, you see it in cults. The, the complete ignoring of strange. Have you ever wondered how come people believe such goofy stuff? But when you tell them that Jesus loves them, died for them, wants to save them, and all you have to do is receive him by faith, they say, well, that's silly. Well, you believe that cabbages descended from the planet Zepton, right? I mean, you believe something goofy. There was a cult in, in, in Montana, in Livingston, in the, in the 90s. They believed that there was a violet fire on top of your heart. Elizabeth Clare Prophet in the Church United Triumphant. It, was, it just took over Livingston, Montana. They believed there was a a violet fire that you just couldn't see on top of your heart that was the spirit of some goofiness or another. Well, hey, Jesus wants to save you. Oh, you're one of those lunatics. No, I'm not the lunatic that believes there's a violet flame on my heart, that's for sure. But you see that in cults. You see that just completely ignoring all the strangeness, right? If they can just have some sort of certainty in how to live and how to feel better, that little comfort that they get there. See, in all sorts of examples, Stockholm Syndrome, people are kidnapped. They're kidnapped. Taken from their family, taken from their home, and they fall in love with those who took all of that from them. They get that comfort of that little inner circle of people whom they know and they feel like they can relate to at some, at some point along the path. And they don't care that they've lost their family or they've lost their home or people are crying or people are... It's a weird thing. Human beings are weird things. We just are. 
right? We're just weird things. So here's what I thought we would do. Because there are plenty of examples of people willing to live in abhorrent situations because of the comfort of something immediate that's more appealing. There really is. So from the, taking the opportunity here, we'll see if this works or not. It is. We're going to take a survey of comfort this morning. A survey of comfort. Of the things that take congregations that once are alive with anticipation and that are once are looking for souls and turns them into that sterile pool of robots or that thing that takes fervent witnesses and people who are taking great risks of faith and turns them into shrinking violets. It's that idea of comfort, right? And so we're going to talk about this, about comfort. And by the way, I just... I've heard this from a number of people about church here. We were too comfortable. I didn't plan to preach this this morning, but it seems like it came out at about the right time. Let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about being too comfortable. Because here's a few examples, and then I'll get to a a point, I think, at the end. I hope I get to a point. We'll see. Is this, the comfort of familiar... That's the first comfort that people crave, that people tend to crave, and that causes them to block out a host of ugly things, a host of, 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 of bad situations. It's the comfort of the familiar, the things that we have in front of us. It's the things that we know. In fact, the first time I know, the first time you see this, one of the one of the best examples of this is anybody know what I'm talking about when I talk about the diaspora in the book of Acts? Two with shy hands, don't want to look like they know too much. Remember what Jesus said, one of the last things? He said, I think I preached about this months ago. I've been here all of eight months. But one of the last things that Jesus said to his disciples is go, right? Go you into all the world, right? And years later, what did you find? You find the disciples still in Jerusalem. They haven't gone anywhere. And so a great persecution comes along, right? Herod kills James, Right? And he looks to kill Peter because it pleases the people. And so what happens is what happens is a great persecution begins to spread through Jerusalem and Christians are being killed. Well, they were killed before that. Right? James was killed. Christians weren't allowed to meet openly. They stayed in Jerusalem. They were mocked, they were scorned, they lost possessions, they lost families, and what did they do? Did they say, Well, let's go talk to everybody else about Jesus like we're supposed to? No, they said, We're gonna stay right here. We like the teaching. We like this. We like that. We like, we like the people we worship with. We're familiar with this town and these streets. We're familiar with that shop, and we know where we can get good deli. I mean, whatever it was, they stayed. See, that's the idea, the comfort of the familiar. After the people are killed and arrested, you'd think that Christians would be fleeing Jerusalem. But they're not. They're there. And I can only conclude this, that when you look at the situation, there's something very comfortable about the city despite the turmoil and the terror that they experienced. God said go, but that's, you know, that, that requires a whole lot of new stuff. That requires learning different streets. It requires learning different restaurants. I mean, whatever. It requires meeting new people. It requires small talk. It requires all sorts of stuff. Why don't we just stay here? We know this person. We know that person. And I know you and you and you. Let's just just remain here. The comfort of the familiar. That old expression, it's a great expression. I first heard it when I I was watching a thing about airline disasters. But he said this, something that I, I, I thought was very good. We often, we often know the devil we have. We're afraid of the devil will get if something changes. We know the devil we have. The saints at Jerusalem, the devil we have is, yeah, people are trying to kill us. Not in mass yet. Here and there. Let's stick together. Let's don't talk too much. Let's listen to the teaching. Let's serve the widows. We'll do our thing. If we go out there, if we go like the Lord said, we might not like the devil we get out there. It's one thing to die here among our friends. It's one thing to die here on streets we know. It's another thing to die out there. It sounds a lot like Israel. 
And this is what the problem with the, the comfort of the familiar, what it does is it does this, it prevents needed things from beginning, from starting. One of the interesting things you see about, and you know this as well, you know what happens is that the, the, the saints leave Jerusalem and what happens? All of a sudden, many people left and right start to be saved. There's a whole world that is basically screaming for hope, screaming for light. They're craving anything that would lift them up out of the darkness they've been living in. <clears throat> and those people in Jerusalem have exactly what they need. They just need to go out and tell somebody. People start to get saved, Gentiles as well as Jews. You know the whole story, I suppose. But, but what happens is as long as they stayed where they were, as long as they, they craved the comfort of the familiar, of the people we know, the places we know, the look of the things where we go, the familiar, new things didn't begin. It happens all the time in people's lives. Oftentimes people put off repentance because it means it'll mean a different lifestyle. People put off doing necessary things spiritually because it will mean changes in their life, and it's unfamiliar. It's unfamiliar. People put off whatever it is. And the Lord addressed this particular example in the book of Acts with persecution. He's not above that kind of thing. And here's the thing, this is what's interesting. In almost all of these cases, what the Lord does to get people to do what he wants them to do and to get to the places he wants them to go feels initially like disaster. The persecution that began to kill Christians in mass in Jerusalem did not look like a good thing at all, but God had a purpose behind it. I need you uncomfortable so that other people can be saved. No dis we call it discomfort for a reason. We like comfort, nothing wrong with liking comfort, as long as it doesn't go too far. So there's, there's the first one, is the comfort of the familiar. There's another one here I'm gonna put is this comfort of security. The comfort of security. I actually think that this is the problem with the Israelites in our, in our example here in chapter. I mean, I'm just speculating. But I actually think it's a big reason why they kept revisiting going back to Egypt. And that is, they were secure there. Sure, it was brutal. I mean, sure, it was... Sure, they were re repressed. Sure, they were forced into servile labor. Sure, they were not free in any way. But at least they knew where their next meal was coming from. Unlike out here in the wilderness where we're no longer comfortable, and we're not sure where our next meal's coming from. We're not sure what's going to happen. We're out here in the wilderness. We're not sure where our next drop of water's going to come from. Back in Egypt, we had all, yeah, I know it was, they were bad, they were kind of ugly people, and they didn't treat us very well, but at least we knew where our next meal was coming from. That's the comfort of security. Some might argue that's, that's a huge problem in the nation at large. We love security so much that we tolerate all sorts of ugliness. Just make sure that we have everything we want and need. Yeah. I'm a grumpy old man when it comes to watching TV anymore. I don't know about you, but I won't say, ah, I can't want you to say it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I want to say it, but I'm not going to hear. Listen, it was just one of those deals, right? It was just one of those deals where they're out here all alone, vulnerable in the wilderness. They want to go back to Egypt because they're a little, they're not even that hungry. They just see a problem coming and they know back in Egypt, that's where the next meal is coming from. And they know that they don't have to defend themselves. Egypt did all of the work as far as defending the borders and everything else. All they had to do was work a little bit and then sit by, I mean, literally we talked about before, pots of flesh. You reach in and you grab fish or you grab beef, I suppose. You grab bits of flesh and bread over here in baskets just waiting to be eaten until you're stuffed with bread. We'll put up with a lot. Also, you have this. You have this example, too, in another place in, in, in the Scripture. I want to have you turn there. I know we're just going quickly through some of this stuff, but the non-returning exiles. How many of you know your Old Testament history real, terribly well, but... But Egypt or Israel had found themselves wound up finally in captivity to the, to, the, to the kingdom of Persia. They'd been gone for 70 plus years from the land that God had promised them. Again, they had experienced all sorts of ugliness. 
Everything from re-education camps, basically trying to turn them into Gentiles, to out and out, I mean, treachery and murder. I mean, just winds up with an attempt at genocide eventually. But before the genocide part happens, what happens is King Persia, King of Persia, Cyrus, comes along and he says, listen, all you Israelites, you want to go home? Go. Go. And you think 70 plus years of Israelites being in captivity, and that was probably all the talk of the town was, in the synagogues. That's where the synagogues, again, were created. They go to synagogue and they worship. How about going home? They talk about returning to the land that God has given them. And oh man, finally Cyrus says we can go. And you know what? Not everybody does. Not everyone returns. Some decide, "Ah, I'd like it better here. Oh, you mean in the land that that stole you away? In the land that has deprived you of a livelihood? In the land that treats you like second and third class citizens? In a land that will eventually try and exterminate the entire Hebrew race? You think it's better there? Well, you know, out there it's kind of scary. You go back out to Jerusalem, it's kind of a rubble, it's a mess. We got to work really hard. There's no guarantee of food. There's no armies. There's no walls. There's no nothing. What is this comfort of security? Hey, at least here in Persia, we have armies to defend us. We don't have to worry about invasion. There's plenty of food to eat. They might not treat us very well, but hey, it's the comfort of security. It's the comfort of security that happens all around. And what this does is this. It prevents risks of faith. Going back to Jerusalem was risky. Going back to the land of Israel was risky. Persia was safe. Ugly, but safe, right? Egypt was ugly, but it was safe. Ugly, but safe. Not fulfilling, but safe. Not satisfying, but safe. No sense of achievement in any way, spiritually or otherwise. But you know what it was? It was safe. It's security. Hi, Cheryl. Might as well admit it. Here she comes walking in the room, takes everybody's breath away. It's safe. It prevents risks of faith. It's what happens in I mean, church, individual believers, churches and believers alike. What happens is we get so used to things being the way they are. We know that we can come here and get this done and come there and get that done. And we'll, we'll experience this when we go. It's, this, it's security. It's security. And again, nothing terrible about security except when it prevents us from taking risks of faith, of reaching out to people, of no longer being satisfied to come in and sit down and leave, of engaging in spiritual growth, of investing in spiritual education, right? Of reaching out to people who need Christ. How do we get too secure? I invited my barber to Easter. You would have, I'm in my head, I'm thinking, well, should I invite my barber to Easter? I mean, I'm getting my hair cut. You know it's my hair cut? So I'm not the hippie anymore that I once was. My dad was a barber. That meant I had the longest hair of any kid on the block. And so what happens is, I, I'm 56, and I still think until my hair's down to here, it doesn't need to get cut, because that's the way I was raised. But I'm in the barber chair. I'm debating with myself to invite a barber to church. I'm like, this is silly. Just invite the guy. What, what the problem? The problem was I was secure in not doing it. I didn't want to risk anything. Guy's got a razor to my head. He's, <laughs> he's cutting my hair. I might come out looking goofy, looking weird, get a mohawk or something. Then I'd really be in trouble, right? But that's what happens all around. It happens in churches at large. Secure. Don't have to worry about offerings. Don't have to worry about bills being paid. Man, some of the best times and some of the best fruit and some of the best gains are made when you have to worry about all that stuff. Because we're no longer comfortable. Now listen, I'll be comfortable with offering the stuff all you want. If you want to just keep giving, right? That's fine with me. But listen, there comes this time when faith needs to be risked. Examples are things like giving and surrendering and witnessing and so forth. But here's another one. I need to move along. Here's another one. Is this the comfort of routine? I heard somebody say something over here. Oh, Cheryl. (laughs) Apparently I'm preaching to Cheryl this morning. He turned to Haggai. You know that one? 
Haggai chapter chapter one. I know. Shouldn't be asked to turn to Haggai on Sunday morning. Haggai chapter one. It's right between the Z's, Zephaniah and Zechariah. I'm going to take you back, go back Old Testament just a little bit. Right? Again, the books in the Old Testament are not chronological. So what happens is you have prophets like Haggai who actually prophesied during historical times that are recorded backward in your Bible. Basically, Haggai is prophesied during the time of Ezra. You might remember that Ezra and Nehemiah, you might remember that there was a, a, a stoppage called to the work of the temple. Stoppage called the work of the temple. If you don't know, it's okay. Let me just catch up. Right? The, we, the, when, when Cyrus said go back to Israel, most did. A lot did. And they begin to work on things. They work on the wall. Then they work on the temple. And then a couple of ugly people come along, Sanballat and Tobiah, and they devise a plan to cause the Israelites to stop building these things and accuse them of of treason and accuse them of sedition and all sorts of stuff in order to get them to stop. And the order comes back, hey, stop. We need to figure this out because some years had passed. And so so back in Persia, back in headquarters at the government headquarters where nothing good ever happens, amen, right? They say, hey, stop the work for just a little bit. We need to check this out and make sure you are not, you know, treasonous wretches, right? And so they stop. They have to. And then not, not long later, the word comes back and says, oh, well, it, doesn't, it appears as though you were allowed to do that. It appears as though Persia or Cyrus did say to go ahead and do those things. It appears they gave you stuff to do it with and provided it along your way. So you go right ahead and do that. And they immediately didn't. They stopped. A couple of years had passed. Years had passed. And what happened was they got into a routine. And the routine didn't include rebuilding a temple. What did the routine include? It included building their temples, their houses. It included building their life. And all of a sudden, oh man, I'd love to start that temple thing, but I just don't have the time. Oh, I'd love to help you over here with the temple and building that back up, but you know what? I got a spare room in my house I'm in the middle of and I just can't do it. Nobody could. They started to plant crops and they started to live a life. And then the word finally comes down through Haggai. Word finally comes down in Haggai says this, verse two, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts saying, this people say, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? And this house lie waste. Let me just convert that from Victorian to today. God is basically saying, these people are saying, we don't have time for my house. Oh, but you've got time for your houses. Just not mine. And I'm the one who got you here. I'm the one who protected you while you were here. I'm the one who provided for you on your way. Oh, so you, this is that, that's what, that's what God's saying. You're all saying it's not a good time for me right now to rebuild God's house. Oh, but you've got time to build yours. What is that? The comfort of routine. They got into a routine that just didn't include some of these things. And you know what? Here, folks, it happens to everyone. It does. It happens to everyone. When they got back to it and they got the the prophet speaking, all of a sudden things started to change. It's funny, everyone needs to build their lives, right? Everybody has responsibilities. Everybody seems to have mouths to feed and everything else. Everybody has stuff that needs attention in our life, and these seem to multiply with each passing day. I always thought that when my kids were 18, that's it, I'm done. I don't have to worry about them anymore. (laughs) Stupid kids. I love them to death, but they're a worry 24 hours a day. I'm still buying stuff for them and everything else. I'm waiting for the payback. It's coming, but I'm waiting for the payback. We all have that, myself included. I know what it means. I know what it means to get into a routine and have other things start to chew up your time. Absolutely. And also this, there's also, there's also comfort in routine. 
I mean, there is. There's a comfort in knowing what's coming in the day. There's a comfort. We get into that sort of, you know, momentum and cadence of life, and we move, and we do, and we go, and we hear, and we just, we know it. We know it real well. We get good at it. There's a comfort in routine. It caters typically to our specific likes. It has predetermined times and, and available resources and everything that we find very, very comforting. And oddly, it seems at times if we get too involved in routine that God gets less and less of our routine as opportunities and things arise that distract us from him. And what this does is this, is it completes, the, it prevents completion of things begun. Because we start to get into a routine where God gets less and less and less. It prevents completion. I don't know if that makes sense or not. You can tell me afterward. But it prevents, it prevents completion. That, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, a couple of examples of this in the New Testament really quick and then we'll wrap it up. But just 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'm going to read you a verse from there along these lines that, that, that speaks to this. This is Paul speaking about the end. His, his end is near. You know this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. His end is near and he says this. He says in verse, oh, let's see, um, verse 6, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. How many of you read that before? How many of you would so love to have the Lord inscribe that on your tombstone? You know what you find as you get older? The only thing that matters is the Lord. Am I, is that not true? I know we say, I've been saying it for 30 years, right? I've been preaching for about 30 years. I've been saying it for 30 years, but I'll tell you this, and it's true no matter when you say it or when you hear it, but I'll tell you this, the older you get, the more real that becomes. That's the only thing that matters. Honestly. That he said, and here's the thing, this is, what, this is again, routine, right? We get into, have you noticed, I mean, I've noticed that I got older too, but have you noticed, I'm, gonna try, I'm sorry, I'm speaking too quickly. Take a breath, adjust my microphone. Have you noticed as you got older that a day turns into months without even thinking about it? I turned 50 in Israel and I thought I'd die there because it was just too poetic, right? You die in Israel on your 50th birthday, right? Here it is. You know what? It seems like that was a couple of weeks ago. I'm 56. What happens? I get into a routine. You put your head down. You go here. You go there. You go there. You go there. You do it. And the things that need to get done are always going to get done tomorrow. And that's what routine steals from us if we're not careful if we're not careful. Because what, what, what you also have to recognize with Paul's words here is that keeping the faith is more than coming to church. It's reinvesting. It's training. It's seeing new people come to Christ. The idea of keeping the faith has at some point it will break our routine at some point. That's the idea with it. It prevents completion. What you've got here then, what you've got here then, there's another comfort, but I'm just going to stop here. It's the comfort of familiarity, of security. It's the comfort of routine. If we're not careful, they'll take things from us. Which means that any time that our comfort is shaken, we should be grateful. Familiar, from f the comfort of the familiar, the comfort of the security, the comfort of routine. Let me just say a couple things. Just take the reverend stuff off and just say a couple things. I'll tell you this. All of those things, familiar, security, routine, has been shaken here in this church. Can I get an amen? amen. 
tell you what, I looked at Cheryl the other day. <laughs> I said, there's, there's this point where I feel like somebody handed me the keys to something that I have no idea how to run. And just said, see ya. <laughs> I know that's a weird analogy. And she said something that was really good too. She said, no matter what happens, she said, I'm glad I came here to meet these people. I can learn something from Cheryl. I'm glad to meet you too, by the way. I didn't mean that. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Sometimes things don't fall out the way we want. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not going to make this an article of faith in this church, but at some point you want to say to people, you want to acknowledge, hey, things have happened. Things have happened that I wish didn't happen. Can I just say that this morning? Can I take a couple of minutes? I wish they didn't happen. I guess sometimes if you just speak about it out loud, people don't whisper about stuff. I want you to know I am very sorry that some of you have lost friends that you're worshiping with for years. And if I could change that, I would. Honestly. I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me or anything. I'm not, I'm not asking for that. I'm just, I, I want you to know that sincerely, down deep in my heart, I'm sorry that some of your friends are gone. Okay? I never, ever would have wanted that to happen. And if, I, again, if there was something I could do about it, I would. So let me just say that. I think it's probably easier to list the things in this church that are the same than the ones that have changed since I've gotten here. Like I said, I've been here like eight or nine months. I can't imagine what it's been like for you people. Some people you know have gone. The routine has been sort of upended a little bit. You've got this lunatic who preaches too long, preaching instead of, instead of steady David Almanzar, who I respect. All of that. It's all changed, and I get it. I would have preferred that having come here, things would have stayed the same. You know what I, I, I don't say what I signed up for. What I expected is to come into a church and just preach and teach. Really. It's just not what we have. I mean, I'm going to preach and teach, I guess, but what you find is I think God deliberately upends apple carts. I, look, nobody's saying all no, no mistakes were made in some of the things that have happened around here, least of all me. But here's the deal. The thing that I think I had a had a talk with Cheryl this morning. She wasn't she was kind of down. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. It's time we get positive about what, and some people are, are, but let positivity start reigning here about what God is about to do. Here's, when I took over in Bozeman, I was 27 years old. The church was about, what was the church? The church when I took over was about, she's what, 10 years old? Yeah, 10 years old. Church was 10 years old, and when I got it, I mean, the church had run about 200, and then when I got it, it ran about 70. And every time we did something, everybody compared it to what once was. Oh, it was so much better. Oh, we used to have this many. Oh, we could staff this, and oh, we could do that. And you know what that does? That kills things. That just kills. One of the reasons it kills things is because it doesn't look forward. Hey, you look in the scripture. When Christ comes in the nativity, things are, are, are the comfort of the world is, is unsettled. The resurrection caused great discomfort in this world. The first church, the early church, caused great discomfort, shook people out of their complacency. What you find is that oftentimes discomfort is a prelude to God doing his best work. Hey, sometimes it's disaster, I don't know. But let's be positive. Let's look around and say, you know what? This isn't as comfortable as it used to be. This isn't as familiar, it isn't as secure, or whatever the case may be. Boy, am I getting through or am I making you mad? Well, I hope I'm not making you mad. No, you're getting through. <laughs> Thank you. 
Because that's the way I feel. That's the way I want to feel. I want to feel, and here's the thing, that, and here's the thing too, I don't want, hmm. I'm looking at Lucas. I don't know why I'm looking at Lucas. <laughs> Look, guys, I don't want to come in on Mondays anymore and take a tally of who's no longer coming to church here. I want all of you to stay. But if you're going to go, go. Let's just get it over with. And I say that in love. I'm, I'm not being a jerk. I'm really not being a jerk. I've been here long enough now to whether you know you can tolerate me or not. And if you can't, I understand. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, let's don't do this. I, this is not what this is about. Okay, good. Go to Cheryl. Here. So I'm going to wrap this up because this is not about me. This is about this church. And it's about moving forward. It's about looking around and saying, thank you, Lord, for disrupting our comfort. Because we know in disrupting our comfort. But here's the thing, folks. This is the only thing about this is. It's going to require more of you. It, it, it is. It's going to require more of us. And I know how difficult that can be. I'm going to ask you to interrupt your routines. We just need to have it. We, we cannot have this church with nobody in the nursery. We can't. We cannot grow this church without people teaching children. We can't. I can go without a salary. That's okay. But we have a debt on this building. And you know one thing we need to do? We need to pay this debt off. Can I get an amen on that? All right, let's all break out our wallets. <laughs> but it's true. My understanding is this building was built in 2008. There's still a $1,010,000 debt on it. Oh, you didn't know that? You're members of this church. <laughs> How did you not know that? It's a secret. No, it's not a secret. Here, it's $1,010,000. There it is, right? <laughs> we can pay that off with a couple of offerings, can't we? But I've talked with the trustee, I've talked with deacons, and I said, this is something we should probably make a part of the plans in the future. Let's pay this silly thing off. That's what I mean when I say, I, it's more than coming and listening, and looking at a slide, nodding an amen, and I know I, I'm good, good for all that. I'm sorry, I need to shut up. But here's the thing. For this church to endure into another decade, two or three, or until Jesus comes back, and that's hopefully by the time I get done preaching for it to happen, we've got to have everybody on board. We've got to have people who have understandably gone into spiritual retirement come out of it. I mean, seriously. We've got to have older people investing in younger people. We just have to. We will. So that's the idea. And it's not for my sake. And it's not for Dave Almanzar's sake. And it's not for the people who founded this church. It's for the Lord's sake. I, I, I'm going to quit with this. I told this to the church in Bozeman when we were doing, we were doing an offering for a building project. I said this. I basically said, when we come back and we take this offering for this new building project, our response to the call is essentially a referendum on our own necessity. This is us saying how necessary we are in this community. How things go in the next few months, and there's going to be changes. There's going to be good changes. I'm going to teach Sunday school. I don't know if that's a good change or not. We're going to have some young family fellowships. We're going to get those organized. We're going to offer Bible studies and everything else. But how people respond is going to be seen as a ref. Are we necessary? Is this church necessary in this community? Or is it no longer necessary? If it's not necessary, then why bother? If it is necessary, let's roll our sleeves up. Let's break the routine. Let's celebrate the things that are gone that are familiar, right? Hey, let's toss security to the wind. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand just for a second. Lord, thanks for the moment. Thanks for your word. Lord, thanks for the examples that you've given us of how you work in discomfort. Lord, there's not an angry bone about anything preached this morning at all. 
Lord, it's just time for us to get to work. It's time for us to hear the sound of rejoicing and praise over what you're accomplishing. Lord, help us, help us not to be the type of people who look back because of comfort and, and value that higher than what can be in the future. Father, help us. Lord, help us to see what you want to do in our community through us, through us as a body, through us as individuals. Lord, help us to keep looking to you. Help us to trust you. Father, we're grateful for the things that you've given us, like the gospel and your word, that we have a message to share with the community. And I just pray you'd be with this invitation this morning. Move people how you see fit. But Father, help us all to set aside the comfort of routine and security and familiarity. Help us all to cling together, to roll up our sleeves, and to serve you with great joy. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.